How many pounds? Are there? Here we go. Hi, everyone. We're almost ready to start now. We're just setting up in the background. So um, we're delighted to welcome you all to our Evidence Synthesis Ireland webinar series. And I'm Patricia Healy. I'm the Programme Manager for Evidence Synthesis Ireland. And just by way of a brief introduction, Evidence Synthesis Ireland is an all-Ireland initiative funded by the Health Research Board um, and by the Research and Development Division of um, Northern Ireland. And our aim is to build evidence synthesis knowledge, awareness and capacity on the island of Ireland. Um, and we have a number of key activities around that aim, but one of those activities is this monthly webinar on an evidence synthesis topic. And I should also say at this point that Cochrane Ireland is included in evidence synthesis Ireland, so we'll probably have some Cochrane Ireland uh, webinars as well. So for our, this is our actual first webinar, uh, Emma's our very first presenter um, uh, for Evidence Synthesis Ireland. So our host today is Dr. Emma France, and she's online, and I'll just introduce her briefly and then I'll hand over to her. Uh, Dr. France is a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing and Midwifery and Allied Health Professionals Research Unit at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Uh, her background is in the social sciences. She specializes in qualitative research methods and has expertise in systematic reviewing, mixed methods research, intervention development and testing, and a current research focus on the health of children and families. Emma is a leading methodological expert internationally in meta-ethnography, which is a widely used qualitative evidence synthesis methodology. She's published several methodological articles on meta-ethnography, designs and conducts meta-ethnographies, advises students and researchers on meta-ethnography, conduct and reporting, and regularly peer reviews meta-ethnographies for academic journals. Uh, Emma led the EMERGE project funded by the NIHR to develop the first tailored meta-ethnography reporting guidance, and she's going to talk to us today about that project. And just before I hand over to say to attendees, if you want to ask a question about the presentation, click on the question and answer section on the bottom menu and type your question in there. You can type your question during the presentation and then when we get to the end, we'll put as many of those questions as we have time for uh, to Emma. And with that now, I think I've all the housekeeping done. I'm going to hand over to Emma. Thank you very much, Patricia. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm going to be introducing the new Emerge Meta Ethnography Reporting Guidance, telling you what it is and a bit about how to use it. Um, so I'm just going to try and move the slide on. It seems to be a bit slow. Hold on a second. There we go. Sorry about that. So the um, Patricia mentioned that the the emerge I led the emerge project team. You can see here that we had uh, all the the names of the team members who took part in that project, and it was a collaboration between a number of different universities, um, which are listed here: Stirling, um, Napier University, uh, Edinburgh University, Cardiff, and Bangor. You can see the photos there at the bottom of the project team. Uh, it was funded by the National Institute of Health Research in the UK and um, the, the project ran for two years from uh, 2015 to 2017, so it's formally ended. And uh, uh, Maggie Cunningham, whose photo you can see there on, on the, the right, um, joined in the later stages of the project to um, uh, assist my colleagues uh, during my uh, maternity leave when I when I went on maternity leave for the last part of the project. We were also supported by a, a large project advisory group of academic experts um, from international um, institutions. Uh, it also included professionals who were not working in academic settings and also lay people, uh, which is slightly more unusual for me, this kind of project. And um, just to say that the, what I'm going to present today is my views rather than that of our funder. But in addition to the team, we had a, co, um, a number of our project advisory group were co-authors on producing the guidance. And I, I've put their names here so that you can see who they were and also their affiliations. And you can see that they're from the UK, but as well from further afield, Belgium, Norway, United States, Canada, um, and including um, a, a lay person who was a co-author on the paper. So 
that's not the full project advisory group and there are more named on on our project website and I'll give you the the web address for that later but I'd just like to acknowledge their their input so today's menu if you like what I'm hoping to cover today I'll very briefly cover what metethnography is just because this could be a mixed audience today we don't really know who's attending um, but the core of today's webinar is about um, the, the reporting guidance, sort of why and how we developed it um, and how to use it. And I'll give you some illustrative extracts from the guidance to, to show you how we intended people to use it. So just to start off, I'll, um, I'll give you a wee bit of background to what metethnography is. You can see here a photograph of uh, George Noblet, very nice photo. He's holding his book, uh, Metaethnography. Um, the reference is there at the bottom of the slide. And uh, George Noblet and Dwight Hare created Metaethnography back in 1988. Uh, George is the surviving member of that partnership. And they originally created it to synthesize ethnographies, so ethnographic accounts. Um, they are social or were sociologists in education research. Um, and uh, George was one of our expert advisors in the later stages of the project, so we're delighted to have his input. I like to think that metethnography is like an elephant, um, or at least the parable of the blind men trying to describe an elephant. So one man touches the trunk and describes the animal as like a snake. Another touches the ear and says it's like a fan. And yet another touches the leg and describes the beast as tree-like. And it's not until you compare, compare and merge all the men's accounts that you can actually get um, an idea of what the whole beast looks like, the bigger picture of what an elephant looks like. So similarly, a meta-ethnography is trying to analyze and distill into a coherent whole um, findings from mul uh, multiple qualitative studies um, on a particular topic to produce something new, a bigger picture um, of the data that's contained within those studies. Metaethnography is the most popular, most widely used method, methodology for synthesizing qualitative studies in, in health research. Um, there were only a handful of such studies in the early, up to early 2000, and now we're seeing over 100 a year being published. So it's really taken off. And you could do metaethnography as a, a standalone study, or you could do it to complement um, some other research, such as a quantitative systematic review of uh, intervention effectiveness, for example. I'll just move on to very briefly explain about the seven phases of metaethnography. Um, they're presented in a linear way here on the slide, but they're much more iterative and they run in, the phases run more in parallel with one another. Um, so very briefly, um, phase, in phases one to three, the researcher is one, deciding the focus of the metaethnography. Uh, two, they're selecting uh, qualitative studies, they're identifying and selecting studies to synthesize. Three, they're reading, closely reading the studies and recording the data that they want to synthesize from them. And then in phases four, five and six, that's when it gets a bit more complicated and these are the phases that depart most from other types of qualitative evidence synthesis. So in phase four, you're deciding um, how the studies relate to one another, what, what's the relationship, are they about roughly similar things, are they about uh, dissimilar things um, uh, or contradictory aspects of your topic, or are they looking at different aspects of, of the topic that you're interested in? So phase five, um, the goal of phase five is about um, when it talks about translating studies, it doesn't mean from one language into another. It's about um, meaning, trying to arrive at concepts or metaphors, if you want to call them that, which embody more than one study. So you're systematically comparing or translating concepts um, between accounts. And in phase six, synthesizing translations, you're looking to create a new interpretation, something that wasn't in any one of those individual studies, primary studies, to provide fresh insights. You're going beyond the findings of the original studies to, to come up with, say, a new theory, new conceptual framework. So phases five and six are one of the key ways that um, metethnography is, is unique from other methodologies. And Noblin here didn't provide a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that. Um, Phase seven is um, 
about communicating your findings to your particular audience, whether in writing or in some other way. So metaethnography, even George Noblet himself says that metaethnography is complex and the complexity is often misunderstood by researchers. And so that takes me to pretty much part of the reason we, we started the Emerge project to develop reporting guidance. Uh, excuse me, guidance. So in terms of our rationale, um, you can see this little cartoon here. It says we have two options, either an evidence-based treatment or an exciting risky alternative. Well, I know which one I would choose, but the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that um, evidence-based healthcare needs robust synthesized evidence. And the high quality meta-ethnographies could and recently have contributed that kind of evidence to policy and practice. Um, I mentioned already it's the most um, commonly used uh, qualitative evidence synthesis methodology in health um, and it's still its popularity is growing um, but we know from previous work that the quality of published metaethnographies really varies widely and is often poor um, and that means it's difficult to, to assess how trustworthy or how credible the findings are and that will make it less likely that the findings are used and they could be used to inform clinical guidelines, for example, um, particularly around patient experiences, which are often more contained in qualitative studies. So before now, before Emerge, um, there was no bespoke reporting guidance for meta-ethnography to, to guide the quality of reports. Um, there was a generic guidance in the form of the NCREC reporting guidance, but it doesn't pay enough attention to those complex uh, synthesis processes in meta-ethnography. Um, we know that reporting guidelines can raise reporting quality, like the PRISMA guidelines that you might have heard of. Um, they potentially could improve the conduct of research as well. So the, the purpose of our reporting guidance is to improve uh, the standard of reporting of meta-ethnographies um, and thereby it sort of indirectly um, making it more likely that qualitative evidence on people's experiences will be trusted and used and inform practice. So the guidance um, is very much focused on reporting. It doesn't tell you how to carry out a meta-ethnography, although people might want to, to use it to inform their work when they're at the planning stage. I'll tell you about the process we used to develop the guidance. Um, we had um, we designed the study to follow uh, good practice in research reporting guideline development um, following Moore et al's 2010 um, journal article on that topic. So we used a rigorous and systematic approach. Um, the full details of the design and methods are in our funders report and I'll give you reference at the end. There's also a shorter version of the methods which is, um, accompanies the published guidance as a, an additional online file. So, we had four stages to the eMERGE study, which I mentioned has formally ended now. Um, and I'll go through them just to explain about what we did. So stage one, we carried out a systematic review of guidance or any guidance we could find um, relating to um, meta-ethnography conduct and reporting. So that included um, methodological papers, any more generic reporting guidelines for qualitative evidence synthesis, critiques and overviews of meta-ethnographies. Um, it also included Noble and Hare's 1988 book. And so we had 57 texts that were included, um, including grey literature. Um, and we were looking for advice, um, guidance, recommendations, advice, um, any st potential standards for conduct and reporting of meta-ethnography. So because we, we needed to establish how meta-ethnography is conducted to know what should be reported, hence the, the focus on conduct as well. And from that first stage, we developed um, 100, over 100 draft standards based on all every sort of piece of advice and every recommendation that we, we um, uh, found in the, the publications. So in stage two, um, we, it had several components. So we carried out an audit of published meta-ethnographies. So we did systematic searches to, to find all published meta-ethnographies. We, we audited them against our draft um, 100 or so reporting standards. Um, we also looked at examples um, that were recommended to us as seminal meta-ethnographies and compared them to those which um, experts felt were relatively poorly reported. 
and conducted interviews with uh, professionals who use evidence syntheses in their work, so not working in an academic context, to find out their reporting requirements. So that enabled us to take those 100 draft standards and revise them edit them, make sure that they were um, meeting the needs of different audiences. And we condensed them because um, some of them were repeated. So we had to organize them by the seven phases of metaethnography and some standards um, kind of uh, repeated between phases three, four, five and six, very similar. So we condensed them down into just over 50 items, which we then took forward to the next stage of the project. So, so we had our draft um, good practice principles draft reporting items from that stage and the next part was to agree the guidance content and standards so we um, we recruited um, international experts in meta-ethnography and qualitative evidence synthesis um, we also had um, policy makers and uh, people who are involved in developing clinical guidelines sort of professionals not working in academia and uh, also uh, lay people with an interest in um, health and and uh, health evidence, healthcare evidence. So we had a workshop with them to discuss the wording of the items and um, to make sure that they were comprehensible and fit to take forward to what's called a, a Delphi study, which is about achieving consensus on what these um, items, reporting items, should be for the final guidance. Um, that from that we found that of those 50 or so items uh, most most of the items people felt should be included in reporting guidance so 46 items reached a um, high enough consensus that we knew those things should be taken forward into the guidance um, which was um, a lot to have um, to create say a, a table of uh, reporting criteria and um, would have been difficult to use. So the next stage was further developing a useful guidance um, that, that researchers could actually implement and, and then to excuse me, disseminate the, the findings of the project. Um, and so we moved, um, we had moved away from the format of uh, following seven phases of meta-ethnography and we'd started to organise the reporting standards under um, the kind of section headings you might see in a journal article. So we had organised them under say introduction, uh, methods, findings, a discussion um, and um, in discussions with our project advisory group and uh, other uh, project participants um, we moved back to the, the seven phases as a structure for the, the reporting guidance to, to really help enhance the phases that are badly reported at the, or generally badly reported at the moment, the tricky analysis and synthesis phases, um, particularly phases five and six. And so I want to give you a, 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 enough of a feel for how we developed the guidance that you can understand um, how it was put together. And after that two year project, um, we uh, look to get the guidance co-published in a number of journals again that, that was considered good practice for reporting guidelines and it was published in january this year um, in four journals the, the journal of advanced Nurse, nursing which is jam um, review of education psycho-oncology and bmc medical research methodology i've just put one of the references there jan was the lead journal i'll give you all four at the end so that is now available and you may well have already had a look at that so i wanted to just say about our our ethos as a project team um, we didn't want the reporting guidance to be prescriptive it's not intended to be um, something which constrains methodological in innovation. It's not meant to constrain advances um, in, in the methodology. So we didn't want to uh, tell people what they absolutely had to do. We didn't want to create a checklist. Um, and we also wanted the guidance to be flexible for other disciplines to use. So not just health sciences, um, it may well be being used um, a bit more often in education where it originated, uh, social work um, and other, other disciplines too. So we're hoping it's not just used by people in health sciences. 
and it's also meant to be used with other complementary guidelines. We didn't want to replicate guidelines that were already out there like PRISMA or Starlight for um, literature searching and literature reporting. So it, it can be used alongside those. And we're well aware that people don't just report in journal articles. You may well be producing a report, a thesis or some other format. And so it's meant to be used for a range of reporting formats. And so it's a bit like a chameleon guidance in that respect and hence the little photo there of that lovely wee, wee chameleon million. So in terms of um, what we hope the impact of the guidance is, we're, potentially it, it has wide-reaching impact. The guidance of course is primarily for researchers who are carrying out and reporting meta-ethnographies and it should benefit researchers and also students who are doing that um, and may also contribute to their, to their training if they're just starting out. But it's also useful to journal editors who publish meta-ethnographies, to academics or other people who are peer reviewing journal articles to know what they should be looking for in a meta-ethnography. People who supervise students as well would find um, the guidance potentially useful. So we're hoping that the guidance will raise the quality of meta-ethnography reporting. It might possibly also um, improve quality of conduct of new, newly planned meta-ethnographies. And we know what we're the sort of uh, ultimate aim is that better, better reported meta-ethnographies um, are going to be of benefit to end users like policymakers, patients, uh, clinical guideline developers, NHS managers, people who use evidence um, and longer term that would hopefully um, enhance uh, health services, um, you know, practice and policy so that the patients are the ones who ultimately will benefit. Now I'm going to talk to you a bit about what's in that guidance, which is the bit you're probably all desperate to hear about. Um, it's uh, got three sort of three parts to it, which I'll just move this slide forward there. So, um, very briefly, just to to give you an idea of the structure, it's um, it's got part one, which is the, what we call the guidance table, which contains uh, what we condense down to nineteen reporting criteria organized by the seven phases of meta-ethnography. Then part two are the explanatory notes, which give uh, supporting information for each of the criteria. Uh, one explanatory note for each criterion, and that gives more detail than you get in the part one summary table. And then part three are extensions to the reporting guidance. And these are aspects of reporting that may or may not apply to a meta-ethnography report. Uh, just depending on on the particular the particular context of that study, so it's important that um, users are aware of all three parts and use them. So not just to use the table without looking at the explanatory notes. And I'll show you the, the format of the table now. Um, the, don't worry about reading exactly what's on on this because I'll show you a better, um, more clear version in a moment. But it's just to give you a. a an indication of the way it's laid out and explained. So the, the guidance table, part one, um, is a one page summary really of the reporting criteria. It's a summary only. And we created this to be easy to refer to for people using the guidance. This is an excerpt from the table on screen. So in column one, you have a, a criterion number and they're numbered one to 19. And then in column two, you have a criteria heading. So it's um, like the title, if you like, for that, that criterion. And then in column three, you have a bit more detail about what you should be reporting for that criterion. Um, it's not meant to be a checklist, which I mentioned already. Um, it's not mandatory, but we have created uh, an evidence-based guideline or guidance, so we would advise or recommend their use. And um, the, the reason that we um, moved back to the seven phases was so that this reporting guidance is really specific to the methodology of meta-ethnography and should help transparent reporting of the phases that are, are currently quite poorly reported in general. Um, meta-ethnography is an iterative process, so although this is laid out in table form, we're not suggesting that you apply um, or necessarily report meta-ethnography in a linear way. And we know that people are often writing journal articles when they've conducted a meta-ethnography or they might be writing a report or whatever, but it, we felt it could be helpful both to researchers and say um, peer reviewers and journal editors to indicate 
where in a report you might expect to see uh, these criteria uh, reported. And so if you look there at um, in row uh, three, for example, it says introduction. We're indicating there that we would probably expect to see criteria one to four um, in the introduction section of an article or a report. So that's just to help you kind of work out where you should be reporting things, but it's not mandatory, it's more a suggestion of where you might report it. So a bit more detail, what's in part two, the explanatory notes? Um, they provide more detail than in that table I've just showed you, than in part one. Um, they tell you a bit more about how to apply uh, the 19 criteria. Um, one explanatory note for each criterion and the explanatory notes are highlighting sort of important aspects to be reported, explaining why, if there's a, a, a strong rationale and outlining some further reporting considerations. Um, they discuss some key issues relevant to the criteria, so for example, what's the impact of uh, the number of primary studies uh, on, your, on um, a meta-ethnography. Um, the explanatory notes also give supporting references, so if there are any, um, it will cite published examples, um, for example, for different approaches to conducting a translation of, of studies. Oh, it's just... Uh, mentioned that. So the part three are the extensions. Um, they're not common to all metaethnographies, so they're there for you to use if you need them. And um, there are three extensions, and I'll go through them one by one. And these extensions are provided along with the published uh, guidance, but as additional an additional online file. If you have any trouble finding that, just let me know and I will send you a copy. Um, so the first extension is called Format and Content of Meta-Ethnography Outputs and really this covers things like what should go in an abstract or executive summary. Um, it recommends that you use the term meta-ethnography in the title and or the abstract and also as a keyword if that's uh, appropriate uh, and relevant to your publication. Um, and because all these kinds of information are really publication specific, for example, all journals have different house styles um, or a report might differ from um, a journal article and format, we haven't included uh, this, these sort of um, criteria or considerations in the uh, table uh, of 19 reporting criteria because those, those 19 criteria are common to all, we hope are common to all meta-ethnographies, whereas this is not common to them. So the second extension, um, involves reporting um, if you have conducted and how an assessment of the methodological strengths and limitations of included studies. So um, if you've done a quality appraisal, um, it tells you what kinds of things you should be reporting. Because quality appraisal is still debated and a contentious practice in meta-ethnography, it's not always carried out and so we didn't put this as part of the, the part one uh, reporting criteria. Um, it's not in that guidance table. It's there as an extension if you need to use it if you have done a quality appraisal. And then the third one is if you have used the tool, uh, the grade CERQUAL tool, which is for assessing the confidence and findings from qualitative evidence syntheses. And that's often used if you're um, conducting a meta-ethnography that's intended to inform healthcare decision making. So if you've, if you've used that, Extension 3 will tell you what kind of things you should be reporting. So hopefully that gives you a sort of run through of the different aspects of the, the guidance in a clear way. I'm going to give you some concrete examples in a readable format, hopefully, um, of some of the reporting criteria from the table. Um, I can't give all of them in a short presentation, so I'm going to focus on phases uh, 1, 4 and 5 just to illustrate the ways in which um, the it can be used. So first of all, I've taken this excerpt from the part part one, the the guidance, uh, the, sorry, the table of cr reporting criteria, and um, you can see um, at the top there in the second row, this is about um, uh, phase one, and. Um, we, you can see that we've, we've adapted the title of phase one slightly to include uh, selecting meta-ethnography as well as uh, getting started, which is what Noble and Hare called it, getting started. And you'll see here that we have uh, four reporting criteria for phase one of meta-ethnography. 
and um, you can see in row three it says uh, introduction and that's just us indicating we would you might want to include this information or you would probably include this information in an introduction section of a report or a journal article. Um, so if you look first at uh, criterion one, it's about the rationale and context for the meta-ethnography. So column two gives you the heading for that criterion, then column three uh, specifies that researchers should describe the, the gap in research or the, the gap in knowledge that's going to be filled, and also um, what the, to specify the wider context of meta-ethnography. So it's quite brief. Um, then if you go to the explanatory notes in the published guidance, it will tell you um, more information. So for example, regarding a, a gap in research, um, it's asking things like, um, you should um, be reporting about whether or not there's already been a meta-ethnography conducted or, or consider that, um, or some other kind of qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, and also to um, describe where, you know, uh, whether there are suitable qualitative studies available to synthesize using a meta-ethnography. Um, and then in terms of what the wider context of the meta-ethnography is, it gives examples such as, you know, it could be that the, there's a particular policy, uh, sorry, political, cultural or social context relevant to this, um, this meta-ethnography you've conducted. Here you could also be referring to any funding sources, well that's, that might be presented in different, somewhere other than an introduction, depending on, on the publication. Um, you might be talking about your resources for the meta-ethnography um, in terms of uh, the time frame that you had in order to conduct it. So these are the kinds of things that you could describe under Criterion 1. If you look now at Criterion 2, this is about the, the aim or aims of your meta-ethnography, where you should uh, describe what that is. And the explanatory notes say, for example, that um, your aim should, should fit with what a meta-ethnography can actually do. So, for example, it's useful for, for developing theories, for conceptual development. Um, and it also asks, for example, that you stay, if you made, if you refine the aim during the course of the study, which, which would be acceptable for this kind of research. Well, if you look now at Criterion 3, uh, this one is about reporting the focus of the meta-ethnography. And here, um, if you look in column 3, researchers are asked to um, describe what their review question or objectives were. And the explanatory notes go on to explain that uh, ideally, your, really, your research question should be congruent with what a meta-ethnography can achieve. Um, and that uh, it recommends that a more precise and focused aim can result in a more uh, useful output of your meta-ethnography. So it's giving a bit of rationale and background and also um, indicating what kinds of things you can report. Then the final criterion there, criterion four, is about the rationale for using meta-ethnography, which is reflected in how we've, we've renamed uh, the title of phase one there. Um, and researchers are guided to say, you know, why did you choose this as the most appropriate methodology um, there are, because there are, um, the expansion notes go on to explain that there are many different types of qualitative evidence synthesis. So you could have chosen, uh, you know, one of many. Um, and also that meta-ethnography is interpretive, not aggregative. So it's not for, it's not really, it's not intended to be used to summarise studies. Um, and it also asks researchers to describe any modifications that they made to Noble and Hare's methodology so that it's very transparent what they've done. We know from um, our previous work that um, the reason that, that researchers chose meta-ethnography over other methodologies is often missing from published meta-ethnographies. And that can make it hard for a reader to judge the suitability of the methodology for the aim. Um, so these four criteria are, are fairly straightforward, but it's worth pointing out that the criteria two, three, and four are often absent from published meta-ethnographies, at least in, in recent work we carried out reviewing them. So this example from the guidance table hopefully illustrates how part, part one, the table, which I'm showing the excerpt for on the slide, and part two, the explanatory notes, um, come together and complement each other. So part one, the guidance table is really the summary. It's high level. It's intended to be very succinct and, and fairly easy to access and use. 
whereas part two is providing more detail, it's giving some explanation and gives more of an indication about the kinds or types of information that's required in your report or recommended at least in your report. So, so you would need to use both really um, to um, help you do to report your meta-ethnography. I'll give you an example now for from a more complex phase of meta-ethnography, which is phase four. Um, I've skipped phases two and three as they're quite straightforward and, and there's not time to go through the whole uh, table of criteria. So there are just two criteria under phase four, which is called determining how the studies are related. And um, in row three here, you can see that we've, um, uh, we're suggesting that information relating to criterion 11 uh, might appear under the methods section. And if you look down to row five, I think that is, um, we're suggesting that criterion 12 might appear in the findings section of a report or journal article. So just to help you work out where to put the information. So if you look at criterion 11, it asks for the researcher to describe the process for determining how studies are related. Um, so that's talking this by studies, it means the primary qualitative studies that you've selected to include in your meta-ethnography. And in column three, um, we're recommending that researchers describe their methods and processes um, in terms of uh, which aspects were compared and how they were compared. And the methods and processes will be specific to your particular meta-ethnography. Explanatory notes um, give example references for a variety of different methods for comparing studies. Um, the notes give more, a lot more detail on what sort of aspects you might compare. So you might have 10 primary qualitative studies in your meta-ethnography and you could compare them by looking at their study aims, uh, the study context, so for example, um, where it was conducted, in which country, um, the type of study, uh, is it a, an ethnography, is it a focus group study. Um, you might also be looking at the theoretical approaches of your, your 10 or however many studies and comparing them on the basis of their research participants, who took part, were they men, were they women, were they children, were they adults, um, and also what the, the main focus of the study was, you know, was it a particular health or issue or social issue. And the explanatory notes also say that you can compare um, studies based on their actual findings, so the meaning of the concepts, or if you prefer to call them metaphors or themes, you know, whether those findings, um, when you compare the studies, are similar findings, whether they're contradicting one another or just about different aspects of the topic you're looking at. So um, the explanatory notes also tell you, uh, give you some examples of how you could compare your studies, you know, in terms of laying them out and, and juxtaposing them. So they talk about methods and processes such as maybe using a summary table or visual diagrams, maps, those, those kinds of things. If you look um, now at criterion uh, 12, which refers to the outcome of relating studies um, um, and describing how the studies are related, um, this is something that's not often reported in published meta-ethnographies and um, we felt it was important. Um, the explanatory notes suggest, for example, that you tell us how the studies relate to one another, but also how they relate to your question, your research question or your review question, I think we've called it. And they suggest um, how you might report the outcome of phase four. So you, it could be in a narrative form, you might have a table, you might have a diagram or a combination of those. So it's really helping you to think about what kinds of things you should report in the, the, explan sorry, the explanatory notes are there to help you do that. So I've Still got time to um, give you another example from the table. So this is an example taken from part one, the table of reporting criteria. Um, it's from phase five, um, which is called translating the studies into one another. And phase five is one of the key areas of meta-ethnography reports, which we know will lack transparency. Um, or often lack transparency. So Although phase five is a complex phase, um, there are only two main reporting criteria here. And they both relate to, or they each relate to the process and the outcomes of this process of translation, um, which is about your analysis and synthesis. And these are 
top level kind of summary key aspects that, that we would like people to report. And then, then there's quite a lot more detail given in the explanatory notes. We've kept the table fairly concise, hopefully to be easy to use and, and to be more accessible to, to the end user. On this slide, there's quite a lot of um, jargon or technical vocabulary, which I won't go into here because um, I don't have a scope really to talk about how to conduct a meta-ethnography. Um, it's really just to take you through the guidance and how to use the guidance. So if you look at um, criterion 13 there, um, uh, sorry, the I think it's the second row you can see there. Uh, we would expect criterion 13 to potentially appear in the methods section of our report or journal article. And we would expect that um, criterion 14 would probably appear in the findings section. Um, so in, in row four, you can see it says findings. We would expect that criterion 14 to appear in the findings section of a report or journal article. So if you look specifically at criterion 13, you'll see that what um, we're asking researchers to report is, is quite briefly stated. Um, so for example, in column three, it just says, uh, describe how you preserve the context and meaning of the relationships between concepts and so on. Um, describe how the reciprocal and refutational translations were conducted. Um, describe uh, alternative in interpretations or explanations and how these were considered. Um, so it highlights sort of specific issues, but doesn't really tell you how to go about doing that. It just gives you the highlighted aspects. As I said earlier, the, um, the guidance isn't prescriptive. And the explanatory notes, we don't tell you how you should do this translation, the process of translation, but we do give you some example references for different approaches to doing translation. And we specify um, that you should try to give your definitions of key terms. So what you understand by reciprocal translation or refutational translation, or what, what um, definition you are working to. And um, we um, also give more detail on exactly which kinds of things you should try to report. Um, so for example, in order to describe how the relationships between the concepts that you were seeing in the studies, how those relationships were preserved, because often concepts link to one another. Uh, you might draw concept maps to show how they related to one another. Um, and then to give another example, so the explanatory notes would say that um, to report how the context of the primary studies were, were preserved or, or borne in mind when you were doing your synthesis, you might, for example, report if you translated studies by particular subgroups. So you might have grouped them according to a particular characteristic, like uh, the kind of participants or the kind of um, medicine they were exploring, if that was relevant, um, before bringing them all together. So there's different ways you can tell us how you were um, how you were preserving context, how you were do, um, looking at the relationships between contexts, uh, sorry, between concepts. And another thing that's in the explanatory notes is that we would recommend you clearly indicate whose interpretation you're presenting. Are, is it that of the research participants who, who were taking part in the original studies? Um, is it the um, interpretation of the author of the primary study? Um, or is it your interpretation, your new interpretation perhaps? Um, and a common pitfall in a lot of published meta-ethnographies is you can't tell whose who's, um, concept or view or interpretation is being, is being conveyed in the written report. So explanatory notes also touch on things like how many studies can be synthesized in a meta-ethnography and it talks about the importance of refutational translation and why it's seen as, as an important aspect of, of uh, phase five. So if you look now at criterion 14, um, which focuses on the outcome of translation and it asks researchers to describe the interpretive findings of the translation. Um, the key word there is, is interpretive. So metaethnography doesn't involve aggregation or summarizing um, of concepts and themes. And then the explanatory notes uh, go on to say, uh, to recommend that you clearly document from which concepts in the primary studies your concepts are derived. So it sort of provides a, an audit trail, if you like, um, and um, recommends that you um, show where your interpretations came from 
and how they're different from the, those in the primary studies that you synthesised. So after all, you're trying to come up with novel findings, not just to recategorise and relabel existing findings. So some of that will also be relevant to phase six, which I won't cover just now um, because I want to have some time for discussion. So I'll just conclude this section. Um, a few points to kind of sum up. So the, the eMERGE guidance is the first tailored or bespoke metaethnography reporting guidance that's, that exists. Um, it's intended to improve reporting of metaethnography, although it might also potentially improve uh, conduct or quality of conduct if, if people use it to help plan meta-ethnographies. Um, and we believe that our, our work on the eMERGE project has in some ways advanced uh, the methodology, sort of our understanding of it as well as the, the methodology itself. Um, you know, there's been um, quite a long time since the original book by Noble in here was published and a lot of work's gone on since then. So the next steps for the guidance will be to uh, monitor any changes in meta-ethnography reporting to see what impact the guidance has, has had, to record feedback from you, the end users, um, on, the, on experiences of using the eMERGE guidance and any suggestions for um, uh, making it even better. And um, in future, we will um, produce a revised guidance to incorporate both feedback and kind of new, new developments, new methodological developments. Some supporting materials um, that, um, for today's webinar. The top reference there um, is the Emerge Guidance, and it's uh, there are four different journals which are given. I think yes, that are listed there um, with their um, document uh, DOIs. There's the second reference there is um, <clears throat> our supporting methodological paper, which focuses in on ways, different ways to do phases four, five, and six um, of meta-ethnography. Uh, the third reference, Cunningham et al, is the full study report from the Emerge project, which tells you how we created the guidance, and um, that's on the NIHR website. In addition, there are some training materials on our project website, um, which were actually produced before publication of the guidance. So there are four short films in a conversation style um, with a junior researcher, Lynn Gilmer, who very kindly um, uh, interviewed her to find out more about, uh, interviewed us to find out more about metaethnography. So there's one with Jane Noyes, who's a member of the Emerge team. She talks about the Emerge project and the reporting guidance and um, how it fits with other international initiatives. Uh, there's a film that feature, features George Noblet, uh, which gives a bit of an overview about meta-ethnography, talks about its origins and contemporary development. Um, I give some background to the project and talk about uh, developing the guidance. And uh, there's a short film with Nicola Ring, another uh, team member, uh, which talks a bit more about the guidance and how you can use it. Again, that, that was produced before we, we published the guidance. So they're all there for you to have a look at if you would like to. So I'd just like to thank our funders, the NIHR, um, our advisors, including Professor George Noblet, um, the whole advisory group and, and our independent chair, Sheena Blair, who chaired the group. Uh, and I would like to thank the whole Emerge project team whose photos you can see there. Um, if you want to contact me after the um, presentation, that's my email address. I have a Twitter account if you like to tweet. Um, there's also an Emerge uh, Guidance Twitter account that I look after. We have an academic mailing list if you want to share ideas, questions, references on meta-ethnography, feel free to join that. And our website, <coughs> I um, excuse me, um, put regular news items up there and resources and publications I keep up to date. So thank you very much for your attention and I believe we now have some time for uh, questions. So thank you very much. Thank you Emma. That was a really uh, very interesting and very comprehensive talk. Um, we do have some questions and so I'll, I'll read those out to you. And while I'm asking those questions, if anybody else has a question, go ahead and type away in the questions box. So the first question is from Jill and Jill says, my understanding was grade circual wasn't for this type of configurative analysis. Has guidance changed in this area? Um, well, I wasn't aware it wasn't 
previously recommended. Um, Jane Noyes, who was a member of our Emerge project team, um, has been very closely involved with developing Grade Circle and they would recommend its use for meta-ethnography. Um, but they would usually uh, apply it to um, the outputs um, they wouldn't apply it to a theory coming out of a meta-ethnography, but they would apply it to any concepts coming out of a meta-ethnography, if that makes sense. But thank you for your question, Jill. Okay, thanks, Emma. And uh, I have a question that came, a circuitous route to me, it came via an email account that belonged to us here on the Evidence Synthesis Ireland, and it's from somebody called Susie who can't make it. And Susie says, can Emma please discuss the use of quality appraisals, such as CORIC, CASP, etc., and how they might apply or not to meta ethnography? Are they considered a necessary or expected step in reporting? Well, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot, there's not, I think, a consensus over whether or not quality appraisal should be conducted for meta ethnography. Um, you do see it very often uh, conducted if you look at published meta ethnographies and those are common tools that, that uh, I think Susie was it, um, said, you know, they were quite commonly used. Um, Noble and Hare didn't advocate use of quality appraisal. Um, they said that it will become clear through the process of conducting your synthesis, which studies contribute more and which ones contribute less. But I think it's a choice for you as a researcher, uh, bearing in mind who your funder is, who your audience is, where you want to publish. Um, a lot of journals will expect, and peer reviewers will expect a quality appraisal to have been conducted. Um, but if you have a, a good rationale for not doing it, then you should explain that. Um, I know that people who've conducted metaethnographies say quality appraisal can be quite time consuming. And so you need to have a reason for doing it. And have a reason f uh, and then use the results of that. So some people use a quality appraisal as an opportunity to do a really close reading of the primary studies and to, to help them do that. Uh, and they may also then reflect in their discussion section on um, did studies of poorer quality um, contribute less or did they contribute quite a lot to, to the output of the synthesis. Some people will exclude studies that they consider in some way fatally flawed. So if they thought if a study didn't have ethical approval or wasn't in some way was unethical, they may actually exclude that. Um, but they might choose to include studies that um, appeared to perhaps have a, a weaker, you know, a lesser quality conduct because you can't always tell whether it's poor quality reporting or poor quality conduct and they may actually still have useful findings. So no easy answer, but that's a sort of summary of uh, what I know about uh, the current thinking on quality appraisal and meta-ethnography. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I have, I have another question here um, uh, through the, the question and answer link. And the question is, based on, for, it's from Jill, based on former guidance, I thought we should be working at second of author interpretations rather than participants, i.e. direct from quotes, or how are you differentiating these? I'm not sure that... I understand, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, there's different levels, if you, if you want to think of it as different levels of data in meta-ethnography. So you'll have, uh, in a qualitative article, you usually have participant quotes or uh, the participants' views expressed in, as a description. Then you might have something more, more conceptual, which would be the, the author of that study's uh, interpretation of what the participant said. And then the meta-ethnography is going to a third, a third level, if you like, where it's you as a meta-ethnographer interpreting what the, the author of those studies uh, came up with. And so some people call the, those first, second and third order constructs, but not everybody uses that language. And I know there has been some, that in some publications, um, it's been advised that you shouldn't be analyzing participant quotes from papers as part of a meta-ethnography and you should really just focus on the concepts or themes that the authors came up with. Um, my personal view is that the quotes have been selected to support the concepts in, in the qualitative studies uh, reports and so you could analyse them as part of the, the concept. Um, where I would have more difficulty with supporting 
analysis of quotes for a meta-ethnography would be if you just took all the quotes out of all your qualitative papers and tried to do a bit of a, a secondary analysis, if you like. Um, I think it, you just don't have enough data to be able to do that. You don't have the whole interview transcript um, and you don't have the whole context that the original researchers had access to. Okay, thanks, Emma. Emma, will you take another question? I know you've answered a lot yeah. already. Yes, yes, go ahead. So in evidence synthesis Ireland, we're very privileged to have our very own qualitative evidence synthesizer, Dr. Linda Beastie, and she's here beside me. So she has a question for you. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really, really useful, especially your breakdown of the three different parts and the examples you offered. Thank you. My question is probably more in relation to the development of the guideline. Did you say at the beginning that you had lay people involved in the process? And yes. Yes, could you speak a little more um, in relation to that? Yeah, so um, ultimately we wanted to get qualitative evidence into um, the evidence base for health, um, health and social care policy and practice. And so we did want to include the views of lay people in our, in our study, you know, what, what's important to them um, in terms of what's reported, um, what, you know, um, it's a, it's, it can be quite challenging for this kind of study, which is strongly methodological with a lot of jargon to include lay people. But we advertised and um, we recruited people, quite a lot of people through the Scottish Health Council who, who were very successful in an advert they put out. Uh, some were uh, lay people who had a health condition. Some were um, lay people who just had a strong interest in evidence-based medicine. Um, so that people had different reasons for joining. Um, we provided training and uh, collated existing training resources for people so that they had an understanding of key uh, research that was relevant to the study. So about systematic reviewing, um, we also created um, like a, a jargon buster list for people. Um, the lay people took part in the meeting from the start to the end, so over the whole two years. Um, a few people had to drop out for personal reasons, um, but they attended project advisory groups, they took part in the uh, consensus workshop online, uh, they also, we had one of our online Delphi studies was specifically for non-academic participants. So that included lay people as well as professionals working outside of universities. Um, and um, they had their chance to say what they felt was important should be included in a, a report from a meta-ethnography. So, was there anything else you wanted to know about that, Linda? No, that's lovely, Emma. Thank you for clarifying some of the issues there. Um, and I presume if we have any further questions on that one, we could email you? Yes, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to say thanks to everybody. There are one or two other questions, but what I'll do, Emma, is I'll, I'll send them on to you afterwards, because just in the interest of time. Um, I want to say thank you very much to everybody who's posed a question and a huge thanks to you, uh, Emma, for your time and for the effort you obviously put into that presentation. It was really comprehensive. Uh, I found it very useful and I'm not a qualitative uh, synthesizer myself. Um, just to say to everybody who's online, if you watch out for our monthly webinars, we will have a variety of different um, evidence synthesis topics. And if you log on to our website at evidencesynthesisireland.ie, you'll be able to sign up to our mailing list and we will notify you then each time we're, we're, we're um, launching a new webinar. You can also follow us on Twitter if you like. And uh, with that, we really just want to say thank you to everybody involved. I'm relieved now that the first one is done <laughs> and then it, it all went okay. Uh, no technological hitches, thankfully. And Emma, thank you very much. It was wonderful. Well, thank you so much and thanks to everybody who attended. Um, yeah, and please get in touch if you have questions that I wasn't able to answer today. So um, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> thank you very much and we'll say goodbye as well here in Evidence Synthesis Ireland and Galway. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.